Blessed Sabbath. Um, shall we reverently kneel for a word of prayer? Our kind and loving Father, Lord, we humbly come before you on this blessed Sabbath day, thanking you so much for your mercies that have been new to us each morning during this week. And Lord, we are so thankful. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for the gift of Jesus. Thank you so much for yeah, this wonderful love heaven has poured out upon the human family. And when we look at Calvary, Father, we can say like Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you so much, Lord, for a love that our minds cannot fully comprehend, but we are truly thankful for. And I pray may this love truly transform our hearts and lives, that indeed when that final crisis breaks upon the world, we will truly reflect the image of Jesus perfectly. Please, may you bless us now as we get into the study, as we look at a, yeah, at something which is unsettling many in Adventism, and many are being shaken, and unfortunately even shaken out, and unfitting themselves for the seal of the living God. And I really plead, Father, that you'd help us to be so settled in the truth that nothing would shake us. Please abide with us now, I pray, for I ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, Satan really don't want us to look at this. You can see all the hiccups. We have never ever had this issue with the TV projecting. But as I was praying that the Lord just impressed my heart that I yeah, just removed that HDMI and put it in another slot. So we thank God. Um, yeah, what we're going to look at is something, as I said in my prayer, which is actually, yeah, a lot of people in Adventism is, 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 is grasping onto the steam. And I see a great, 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 great danger. A great danger. And actually, it was a couple of, yeah, I'm not sure, maybe a month or two or a couple of weeks, I can't remember, that another ministry had sent to me this, um, well, I know the individual, not, they're not from this country, but they sent to me a, a, a study. And when I looked at the study, I saw danger. And I wrote back to the person, I emailed him, and I said, mm -mm, this thing is not right. This is not, yeah, the Lord would not have us to do this. But then I, I, I said I would address it in time, but I, I, just, I, I just did not have time to address it. But then recently I saw it agitated again from a very, very well-known minister. And I just realized that, yeah, unless God's people are warned against this, it's going to do great damage to present truth. Great, great damage to present truth. Now, what I'm going to say is, in which we're going to study, and we will see how far we can go. There's a few things we want to look at. These things is that some are teaching, and we want to look and see is this true? That in 2024, the spring of 2024, I'm not sure which spring, I think maybe in America spring or a Jewish spring, I'm not sure. But in 2024 spring, there is Sunday law is going to be enforced. This is what's been taught, agitated widely. And many people are viewing this, and some believe that this is truth. But also look, and partially where this is coming from, partially where it's coming from, is so-called a 6,000-year prophecy. I don't know if you've heard of it before. <laughs> A 6,000 year prophecy. So I'm going to look at this so called 6,000 year prophecy and see. Now, I, I, I believe that inspiration does talk about 6,000 years. I truly believe that. That's, that's spiritual prophecy. 
It's clearly in, inside the writings of the spirit of prophecy. But what I don't believe, which we're going to speak about, is that she specifically warns against something, even with the 6,000 years. And then lastly, also what's been agitated, as I heard a couple of days back, which we're going to just touch on. We're not going to deal with it. We'll just touch on it. We don't have time to study it now. But there are many agitating false who, 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 are, who are holding on to and advocating people that are rising. There are many that are rising now and claiming that they are prophets called to pick up the work where Ellen White ended the work. And we want to look at that and see, are these, are these people truly prophets? You know, when I heard how they were called to the prophetic office, that God sent them a WhatsApp message. And based on the WhatsApp message, they knew that they called to the prophetic office. Like, uh, like how would God work like that? Calling someone to the prophetic office through WhatsApp? I, that is hard for me to believe. But we want to look at that, that issue as well as of these so-called prophets, these many prophets, now, if we were studying, we would show you, and we're going to look at the writings of Ellen White and see, did Ellen White speak? Because many people, whoever comes up, oh, this is a prophet, and they're running to their corner, okay, let's hear what they're teaching. Friends, when you read the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, and I challenge anyone, can you show me one quotation in the, in the thousands of words that she wrote, where she ever mentioned as a prophet of the there's not a single quotation on those lines. But we will read when she was asked, is there somebody to come after you? I want us to see a response. What does she say? That's what we're going to look at. Now, I want to ask you a question. Matthew chapter 24, in verse 32 onwards, Jesus says, now before I even go further, let someone, now I'm going to say that I oppose Sunday law coming in spring, um, 2024 Sunday law. I, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe there's a Sunday law coming 2024 in this, exactly in spring. of. I don't believe that. That's not Bible. That's not spiritual prophecy. Not Bible, not spiritual prophecy. Do I believe a crisis is coming? Yes, I believe a crisis is coming. But can we specifically point, point and say 2024 spring Sunday law is coming for sure? We cannot do that. Now, I'm not going to mention names of ministries and ministers who are teaching this. We're just going to study, and then you go, and you go with the weight of evidence. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 32, Jesus says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender, and it put it forth leaves. He says, You know that summer is nigh. He says, So likewise he, when you shall see. Not, listen to what Jesus says. He says, Likewise he, when he shall see. Friends, Jesus says we know that his coming is near. He says when we shall see these things come to pass. He says they know that my coming is nigh even at the door. So based on what should we know that the coming of Jesus is, is nigh? Is it based on time or based upon events you see? He says when you shall see these things which he spoke of in Matthew 24. Now someone says how you know that Jesus is not talking about time? Well, let's keep reading. He says, verily I say unto that this generation, the generation that sees these signs, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And then he says, verily I say unto you, he says that, that, that everything will pass away, but he says, my word shall not pass. And then he concludes by saying, he says, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man. No, not the angels in heaven, but my father only. Now, how clear can that be? Like Jesus is crystal clear of that day and hour, no, no man. So when you start believing a man that is teaching day and hour, is teaching when the year Jesus is automatically, you know what that tells me about you? It tells me that you place a higher confidence in that man than Jesus. Why? Because Jesus says no man knows. No man knows, friends. Now, I want us to look at this issue, and I want to touch on the 6,000 years, even though we have taught it, we, we want to see that there's a correct way of teaching this, and there's a wrong way of teaching this. And we want to look at what is the right way and what is the correct way. Because based on this, people are coming to this conclusion. And it's not one minister, it's not one ministry, it's many. And I'm seeing that I know that this day is going to pass and there's going to be no Sunday law. It's going to bring a great damage to people's faith, a shock to their faith. Now, friends, you might think, hey, 
I don't shock their faith, they don't print damage. Let me say this. There was a man that was teaching around 2019, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember when he was teaching it, but I think it was that year. I, I could be mistaken. He was teaching as a minister, as a minister within the Adventist Church in the United States of America. He was teaching that the Sunday law, that the Sunday law is going to be passed in America at a specific date, it gave the date, and it was not one of them. He was just leading out in it, and there were many others that were teaching this as well with him. Do you know what happened? The date passed, and there was no Sunday law. Do you know, do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? Just a year later, what that man started doing? He started making an attack against the 2300 year time prophecy. Because his time prophecy, which he thought was genuine, when his time prophecy failed, he thought it was genuine. But the thing is, he went against inspiration to make a time prophecy. He started attacking the 2300 year prophecy. Then he started attacking Ellen White, that she's not a true prophet. And now the man left the Seventh-day Adventist church, him and his wife. Now, his wife, I think some of us know, you must have heard her testimony before. But they both left, they both left the Adventist church. Now, what I want us to do, someone says, why are you spending time on this? Why are you wasting even time on this? You know why Ellen White says in early writings, page 63, that quotation where she talks about present truth, before she even gets to present truth, the first sentence on that page, she says, I saw the necessity of the messengers. Of who? The messengers, she says, watching especially to check fanaticism wherever it arises. So what should they check? What should God messengers check? Fanatism. I don't believe they should attack the minister and the ministries. They shouldn't do that. Some people go too far and they start putting, mm -mm, we shouldn't attack ministers and ministries because those are God's children. But we should attack the error unsparingly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not so much the individual or the ministry, but the error should be attacked unsparingly because it's going to do damage to the church, to the truth. So I want us to see, let us look at this issue. Now, Come and read your Bible to Revelation chapter 10. I don't know how far we're going to get because this is quite a lengthy study, but I'm not going to finish it. Revelation 10. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation 10. Now, if you want to know where do they get the time prophecies from, let me just write it on the board before we fully get there. I want to write it on the board. There are time prophecy of how they get this date, that the Sunday law comes, and then they give other dates, exact dates. And then they say that the second coming takes place in 2027. They say that it takes place exactly 2027, and they give the season. But now where do they get, because they give close probation time, exact time for close probation. They give exact time for, um, I'll show you the chart now. Let me show you, okay, I'm gonna get to the chart. Let me show you the chart quickly. Now, it's not one ministry, it's not one minister. As I'm saying, before I even saw uh, this minister present, somebody, another ministry sent me advocating this, tr this so-called truth. Now, I don't know if you can see here, uh, preparation time and then I got here, spring 2024. Can you see that? Yes. What's under spring 2024, right yet? Yes. National Sunday Law. Now, how do they get this? They walk, they walk backwards from, from, this, from this 2027 and they walk all the way backwards and they get spring 2024. Now, it says here day and hour announce fall. So what, 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 sees, what they say fall? Autumn. Autumn. In America, they call it fall. So I want you to see here. Uh, now, let me blank that. I'm coming back to that. How do they get dates for the close of probation and other events? How do they get it? It's, it's these dates. Now, some of us might have never heard of these dates before, but it's these dates, and it's, these are biblical dates. It says, have you heard of the one, I'm sure we all heard of the 1,260 years, right? Then there's the 1,290 years, it's Bible. And then there's the 1,335, it's Bible. So based on these three dates, they are able to pinpoint exactly, I'm saying based on these dates, they pinpoint exactly close of probation. Um, let's see what, what it says here. Judgment of the living, 1,260 years, then the close of probation. Latter rain, 1,290 days, 
it's all linked, 1,335 1, days brings you to the day and hour of Jesus' coming. So I'm not going to go through all this, but this is the uh, time, time prophecy. And if you can see on the top, what's right on the top? Well, I was, what is this based on? Six, yeah, but what, what is it based upon? If the 6,000 years end in when? Autumn. That's for 2027. Then they're saying based on that, we expect Sunday Lord Spring 2024. Now, friends, as I'm saying, this thing is gaining wide attention. And I truly believe that those who are advocating are not evil people. I believe that they're good people who love the Lord and the Lord loves them. But what they fail to understand is something stronger than time to move people, and it's Calvary. See, the love of Jesus can do what time setting cannot do. If a man can stop sinning, it's not going to be based on time. And if it is based on time, when that time does not happen, you know what that man's going to do when, when it's not fulfilled? He's going right back to his sin. Why? He doesn't have a You know, let me illustrate this. Prophecy is like, you know, when somebody's dying, you know, when they're, they're almost dead. Prophecy is like when you're giving that man, a, you know, that electric shock on his chest. Now, what happens to that man after you give him that, and he starts, he starts, he starts breathing? You can't keep giving him that shock, especially with time. Yeah. If you keep giving him a shock with time, what are you going to end up doing to him? Yeah. You'll kill the man. And what I'm saying is this, I've seen time kill people. Spiritually, it killed them. Now, I want you to, you know, some people are not, they don't, they don't listen to the Bible and spiritual prophecy before we even start studying. Do you know who's this man? We showed you the last time. Alex Jones. You know who's this? Alex Jones. Now, Alex Jones, I want you to hear what he has to say about time setting. The man's not even a seventh day Adventist. I want you to hear what he has to say about time setting. And then we're gonna, he's going he's gonna to tell us some things about Bible. Revelation. Now just listen to what he has to say. What happens when people set time? He would get really upset when he'd see these preachers on TV setting a date. He would say those people are deceived by setting a date. Then when it doesn't happen, that's going to make people fall away. That's a tool of the devil. Right. And he was just really, uh, he said, you know, comes like a thief in the night. No man knoweth is Christ of the hour right. of the return. And, and so then I've seen the left use yeah. that when this, these preachers get a bunch of attention saying it's this date for like a year, then it doesn't happen. Then they say, oh, the Bible's disproven. No, the Bible says no one knows. And if they tell you they know, that person's bad. Yeah, exactly. So, did, did you hear what he said? When people set dates and it's not fulfilled, people fall away. Now, did the prophet say that? Did the prophet say that? She says there will always be false fanatical movements made by persons in the church who claim to be led of God. Those who will run before they are sent and will give day and date for occurrence of unfulfilled prophecy. See, she says that they run before they are sent. In other words, God has not sent them, but they run. Remember that man that Joab sent? Yes. He kept pressing Joab. Yes. When, 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 when Job said okay to the one guy who was a runner, Joab said to the runner, go and tell King David his son died. Tell him all what you saw. And the guy ran. He was a runner. And then the next guy came, he fell at Joab's feet. He says, let me run, let me run. Joab said, do you have a message? <laughs> and the guy said, let me run. He's pressing Joab to run. And he never see what happened. Joab said, run. You know, man, all sprints at his, his, that guy in front of him. And when, when the king sees him, the king says, yes, what do you have a message? He gets to the king and he got no message. The king says, stand aside. Many are running with no message from God. Man-made message. Now, I want us to see what she says. She says that they will give day and date for occurrence of unfulfilled prophecy. Then she says, blue words, the enemy is pleased to have them do this. Now, who, who, who wants us to give day and date for unfulfilled prophecy? She says the enemy clearly wants us to do this. For they are successor failures. And lead, well, she says the enemy is pleased to have them do this for their success of failures and leading into false line cause confusion and what's the next word? Unbelief. Do you know why everyone will be outside of the city? Come with me to Hebrews quickly. Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I want you to see why everyone 
yeah, why will people be lost? Hebrews chapter 3. Are we all there? I want you to see why people will be lost outside the city. Hebrews chapter 3. Why they will not be able to enter the city of God. Hebrews 3 verse 19. She says, the Bible says, So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. So question, when people say day and date and, and, and prophecy is not fulfilled, what are they actually preparing people to? Where, where are they preparing people to be? Outside of the city. Outside of the city. Outside of the city. Now, I want to say this. We're in Revelation 10. Let us go there quickly. I want us to look at Revelation chapter 10. Now, as I said, that they're getting the times from the 6,000 years, the 1,200, the 1,290, and the 133, 1,335. Now, I want us to look at Revelation 10. Now, as much as I don't believe this is true, I believe the Sunday law is very near. Well, how do I know that? Based on the prophetic events. They indicate that the coming is near. She says in Great Controversy 370, 371, she says, though no man knows the day, nor the hour, she says, we are required and expected to know when it is near. So can you see the balance there? Though I cannot know the day and the hour, she says, I am required and expected to know when it is near. So I cannot know day and hour, but I am required and expected to know when it is near. Now I want us to see Revelation 10, verse hmm, 6, actually verse 5. Let me read 6. Revelations 10, verse 5, and verse 6. It says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted his hand to heaven. Now, friends, we're not studying Revelations 10. But Revelations 10 is when the angel comes down from heaven. Actually, it calls him an angel. But when you read the Bible commentary here, yeah, she says that this is none other than Jesus himself. He comes down and she says that he puts his foot, the Bible says he puts his foot on the, on the earth and on the sea. And there's a little book in his hand that is open. This little book is Daniel, the book of Daniel, specifically the prophetic part of Daniel, the, one, the 2300 year, is a two, yes, the 2300 year time prophecy. It's now unsealed. And then he proclaims with a loud voice with his foot on the land and his foot on the sea. Inspiration says this represents the wide proclamation of the, the, 18, the 1844 message that will go far and wide. And then he, after, after the message goes through, and remember John eats this book, the sweet book to his taste. But when he eats it, when he, when he digests it, it's, it's bitter. I need early writings. It's bitter. Now, I want us to see what does the angel swear? Now let me ask you something. Oh, thanks. If, 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 if um, the angel swears was Jesus, I'm asking, would Jesus go against his word? He's not going to go against his word. Now look at what he swears. In Revelation 10, verse 5 and 6, it says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, the sea and the things that are therein are therein. And look at the conclusion of the matter, what he says. What is he swearing and saying? He says that there should be time no longer. What does he say there's going to be no longer? Time. Now let me ask you, because when I read it, this is what I thought, and then I realized in spiritual prophecy when I read it when I first, uh, uh, doesn't mean that. What do you think the angel means when he says time shall be no longer? This is Jesus. What, what do you think it means? Huh? Be huh? Prob probation is closed? No, be time. Okay, amen. Let's test that answer out. When he says that time should be no longer, how do I, I'm just saying, reading from chapter 10, how do I know that he's saying that probation is, that this is not referring to the close of probation, it's simple. Because this is what he says in the conclusion of the chapter, verse 11. If probation is closed, why would he say this? And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. 
So if probation is closed, why would he say prophesy to them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this indicates probation is still open. Yeah. When he says time shall be no longer. Now I want you to see this quotation. What does this mean? This is from Bible Commentary 971. It's a, a, a direct comment on verse, um, verse 6. It says, the time which the angel declares with a solemn oath is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but what is it then? But of prophetic time, which would proceed the advent of our Lord. So what does he say? There's no more going to be prophetic time. Now, my question is this. When... The context of this, what prophetic time, after this time he says there's going to be no more prophetic time. What, what is the context? When I'm saying the context, think what I said. In Revelation 10 verse 1 and 2, the angel comes down with a book that has just been opened. Which only sealed book was there? Daniel. But what was sealed in Daniel? Huh? Let's go there so, so we can. I don't want to just speak. It was then we were just going to take my word. Daniel chapter 8. Let us go to Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Are we there? Verse 14. I'm not going to read it. Verse 14 says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Verse 15. Even though it doesn't mention verse 15. Doesn't mention it by name. Verse 15 is Jesus. How do I know it's Jesus? Because he commands Gabriel in verse 16 to make Daniel to understand. So yeah, as a direct command from someone of higher rank, because a lower rank can't command a higher rank. This is someone higher than Gabriel is Jesus. And then I want you to see verse 17. Tell me when, based on the angel, when is the 2,300 year prophecy for? Based on the angel, for which time? Look at verse 17. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for take note, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So when was the 2,300 year prophecy for when? The time of the end. Now, the book of Daniel, not the entire book, we are told in Daniel chapter 12 that the book, verse 4 of Daniel 12, was to be sealed. And do you know when, until what period of earth's history? It uses the word in verse 4. Let's go to Daniel 12, verse 4. Let's go there. Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Are we there? It says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Take note that the book was sealed until what period of earth's history? So question, it was sealed until the time of the end. Now think of, so at the time of the end, what, what are we to expect at the time of the end? The unsealing of what? But now question, which part of Daniel was for the time of the end? We just read it. Which part of Daniel? Daniel 8. That was, that was, he was told that's for the time of the end. And then we are told, seal it up, Daniel, for the time of the end. The only thing for the time of the end of Daniel was the 2,300-year prophecy. So when this angel comes down with Revelation 10 with the book open in his hand, what part of Daniel is now open when he comes down? To Daniel 8.14. So when she says here yeah, that when the angel says that time's no longer, what, does she, what, what did the angel refer to? prophetic time, which would precede the advent of the Lord. That is, now listen to this. So let's put the 2,300 years here. The 2,300 years. Let's put it here. She says, that is that the people will not have another message upon, what's that keyword? Now, I want you to follow what she says here. She says they're not going to have another message based upon what? This is another, many people get confused. Many people get confused on this. She uses, she doesn't say time, she says what? Definite time. Definite time. Definite time. So after the 2,300 years, was this a definite time or was it a guest time? This was definite. 
How do we know it was definite? They said 22nd of October, 1844. Was it fulfilled 22nd of October, 1844? Yes. So this was, this was definite, definite time. This was definite time. So she says, after this prophecy, can we expect another definite time? No. There's no definite time. Definite time means that you say, 22nd of October, 2024, Sunday law comes. Definite time is saying, um, 12th of September, 2025, Sunday law. That's definite time. Pro inspiration says you cannot do that. Cannot do that. Now, listen to what she says. After this period of time reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning, this is important, the longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Now there's a key phrase as well, yeah, which helps us with the 6,000 years. She says that the longest reckoning the longest reckoning reaches where? Autumn of 1844. Now please help me context. What is she referring to? Which time prophecy? The 2300. So question, what is the longest time prophecy we have? The longest definite, definite time prophecy? Huh? So question, is the 6,000 year definite time? It can't be a definite time. We, that's very clear from this quotation. It can, and based on Jesus, Jesus said, time shall be no longer. So the 2300, time shall be no longer. For sure we can know that the 6000 is not a definite time prophecy. How do we know that? When you read inspiration, she gives many dates for the 4000th year. She gives it at the birth of Jesus. She gives it as his baptism, 27. She gives it at his death, Calvary. What is she trying to tell us? That is not in reference to a definite time. She was giving us the generation. The generation, not a definite. She was saying that the life of Jesus from his birth to his death was the 4,000th generation. 4,000th generation. Now, if this is the longest time prophecy, then, I mean definite time prophecy, then it cuts this out as a definite time prophecy. Also, if this is the longest time prophecy, then it also cuts this out. It also cuts, it also cuts this out as well. Never ever heard of this? Yes. 25, 20. This is also something that was, which, which had been widely agitated a few years back. There's a few people who still cling to this. 25, 20, and they say that it ends in 1844. Now, question, which is bigger out of these two things? 25, 20, or 2000, which one is bigger out of them two? Now, if she says that the longest definite time prophecy is 2,300 year prophecy, can this be a prophecy? It's not a prophecy. No, and we can deal with this. James White refuted this 25, 20. He refuted it. Now, I want to read a quotation in Great Controversy 351. Actually, I'm not gonna even read it. Do you know this quotation, gymnastics, or get, get done over this quotation? Gymnastics, to try and prove that the 2,300 years is not the longest time prophecy. Gymnastics. But I'm not gonna read the entire thing. She says, Miller and his associates proclaimed the longest and last prophetic period to view, in view, to view in the Bible was about to expire. Now let's just stop there. What does she say Miller proclaimed? And is the longest, and the, what's the key word of the longest? The lost. So what is the longest and lost time prophecy we have? 2000, what, what, did Miller, what was Miller preaching? The 2300 year time prophecy. Now someone says, but Miller also taught the 2520, so we got you. Now that's true. Miller and some of them also were teaching 2520, it's in the charts. But now I say, I'm not going to debate which, what is she referring to. I'm not going to debate you. Let's read the quotation and see what time prophecy does she refer to that, mil, that was the longest and lost. She says that the judgment was at hand and the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. The preaching of the disciples in regard to time was based on the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by Miller and his associates announced the termination of what prophecy? 
So question of Daniel 8.14. You can't debate this thing. The prophet, she doesn't acknowledge 25.20. Not the ones. She acknowledges 2,300 year time prophecy. Now, if we've identified this as the longest and lost, then we, we, we can fully understand that this is not definite. This is not definite. I showed you the chart. I'm not going to get into that now. Now, what I want us to do, come with me to Matthew 24 quickly. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Are you saying Matthew 24? I want us to read it maybe a more solidly. Matthew 24 says it, but Mark says it a bit more solid. Come with me to Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. Mark 13, verse 32. Are we there? Now listen to what Jesus says. Now I want to ask you, how do you understand this? He says, but of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. My question, how do you understand this? Because Jesus says, of the day and hour, he says, knoweth no man, no, not the angels, not, neither the Son but the Father only. I want to ask you a question. Does Jesus know the day and hour of his return? Mm-hmm. Sorry? Yes. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Hearing yes and no. <laughs> how do you understand? He says of that day, so you say he knows. So then how, how would you be able to pr- prove that? Okay, I want to ask you a question. When Jesus became a human, was he still divine? He was still divine. He clothed his divinity with humanity. Question, yeah, it's true. There were certain things that Jesus never used his divine power to accomplish. He depended on his father to accomplish everything he done so that he could be our example. Now, he was still divine nonetheless. That's a mystery, how he could be human and divine in one. It's, it's a mystery we cannot understand. But I want you to look at this text carefully. This text, that when it says that Jesus does not know the ten hour, no man, no angels, actually the King James trans- translates this a different way. I want you to see how James White viewed this text, which is correct, and how Ellen White viewed this text, which is correct and how even certain commentators view this text, which is correct. I'm reading from James White, that's Ellen White's husband. So this is what James White wrote. He says the old English version of the passage reads. So James White is telling you how the old English reads, not the King James, the old English. He says, but of the day and hour, no man make it known. Neither the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father makes it known. Are you, are you, are you seeing how James White understood this text? Not that Jesus don't know, but that no man will make the day and hour known. Not the angels, not even the Son will make it known, but the Father himself will make it known. Will the Father make it known? Yes, he's going to make the day and hour known. Early writings is crystal clear that he speaks the day and hour of Jesus' coming. But when does he do that? Not when probation is open. At the seventh plague, when probation is closed, he gives the day and the hour of his son's appearing. Why doesn't he do it now? Because he knows the, the, human na- the humanity's nature. You say, how, how do you mean God knows our nature? Can't you just speak it now so we can get ready? We know when it's coming. Friends, you know when the Sabbath comes every week, but how many times you're late in preparation? Now you want God to speak the day and hour when you're not even ready every week for the Sabbath. You'll be lost. That's why I don't speak the day and hour. He keeps it a secret and he says, you need to get ready. Now it goes on. He says, Albert Barnes, that's also a commentator, in notes of the, in the gospel says, others have said a verb rendered knoweth means sometimes to make known or to reveal. And that the passage means that that day and hour, none make it known. Neither the angels nor the son, but the father. It is true 
that the word, yeah, uh, the word, what is this, has. Sometimes that meaning as 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2, I'm not going there, but Paul says, make it known. So, based on this text, it means that Jesus will not make it known, the angels will not make it known, a man will not make it known, but the Father will make it known. So when a man says, that he, when he wants to make known the day and hour, whose position is trying to take? God's position. God's position. Now look how Ellen White understood this thing about um, the day and hour of Jesus' coming. She says, but the day and hour of Jesus' coming or of Christ or coming of Christ has, he has not revealed. Now listen to the red words. Let's see if Ellen White understood it as James White. She says, he stated plainly to his disciples that he himself could not, what's those next word? Make known the day and the hour of his second coming. Can you see? It doesn't say, I don't know. He says, I, he says, I cannot make it known. So Jesus knows the day and hour, but he will not make it known. Neither will the angels, but the Father himself. The Father himself. Now, let us come to the conclusion of this thing. Come with me to Daniel. I want to deal with these dates. 1260, 1219, 1335 years. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel 12. Daniel 12. If you look at this chart, I want you just to look at this chart quickly. We're going to Daniel 12. Can you see these dates? I'm not making up that they teach these dates. Can you see the 1,335 days? The 1,290? Can you see that it's, according to them, it gives them the timing of all these other events, the day and hour, the close of probation. It gives them all these things. Judgment of the living, if you see the 1,260 starts and the judgment of the living. So it gives them all these so-called dates. Now I want us to look at this and, and see, look, look at Ellen White says here. Wait, let's just see one more thing here. So universal Sunday law, and what do they have here? Letter rain, loud cry. Now listen to what the prophet says about that, about the letter rain, loud cry. I'm not going to read the entire thing, I'm going straight to the bottom. She says, we are not to know the definite time, either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. How clear can that be? We are not to have a definite time for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Issue of false prophets. Before we get to Daniel 12, so that I have to touch, because this is the last thing I'm doing. The issue of false prophets. Did Ellen White prophesy or mention, hint, that when she dies, God's raising up another prophet. I want us to read. This is from Mr. M. M. Campbell. February the 3rd, he wrote this, 1943. <coughs> I want you to see what he has to say. Not many months before Sister White had an incident, uh, incident when she got hurt. Elder Mont. Gom, what's that? Montgomery and I and, other, and, and one other brother visited her at Elm's Haven. Elder W.C. White and Sister McIntoffer were present at the interview. In the course of our conversation, I asked Sister White if she had any light as to whether she would live until Jesus returned. She replied that she had no light as to whether she would or would not live till then. I expressed the earnest hope that the Lord would spare to see the great controversy on earth clear through, the, through to the second coming. For I said, if you are laid away, now listen to what he says, the man almost prophesied, Mr. Campbell, if you are laid away, we shall be pestered with all sorts of fanatics arising, claiming to be your successor. Do you know in Ellen White's time, I read so much, I would have put them here, but because of time's sake, do you know how many people came to her when she, they knew that she was about to die? And they said that we, we have come to take up your work where you live. And Ellen White did not give them the sanction. Many came, many wrote to her that we, God has called us and she would not give them the sanction that indeed God has called you. Her quiet reply was, the Lord is perfectly able to, to care for his cause. Then I asked, in the event of the Lord calling her to rest, another person 
was likely to be raised up to take a place. So it's oxen that should God call you to rest? Will another person take your place? Several of her books were laying on the writing table attached to a chair. She spread her hands over them and said that in those books were outlined the information needed by our people for the rest of the journey. <laughs> How clear can that be? You're looking for another prophet. When God has given us so much writing, she says to take us, to lead us to the conclusion of our journey. Why look for another when we got all the writings? And many people got the writings, they don't read the writings. But they want another prophet. Read many of them. Now someone says, oh, that's Mr. M.M. M. Campbell is lying. Because you know these people, they start saying he's lying. So let's go to the prophet herself and let's see what did the prophet have to say. She says, the question is sometimes raised. She's telling us what people would ask her. What if Mrs. White should die? I answer, the books that she has written will not die. They are a living witness to what saith the scriptures. She says, yes, I might die. Don't expect, ex pick up the books and read them. They're not gonna die. So why are the people looking for another prophet? When we got so much writings, She says, Selected Messages, Book 249, we shall encounter false claims, false prophets will arise, there will be false dreams and visions. Beware of all of this. Again, she says, the light given me has been very forcibly, forcible that many would go out from amongst us, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. False prophets will arise and will deceive many. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. So when people go and they cling to this so-called false, they're false, they are false prophets, and they cling to this false prophet and that false prophet, oxen question, are they being settled all the truth or are they being shaken? They're getting shaken. They're being shaken. Now sometimes these false prophets come with some exciting message and why people grab onto their excitement hoping that that's going to set them free. There's nothing that can set us free but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what the songwriter says, oh precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The prophet says there is a remedy for the sin sick soul. Where is that remedy found? In Jesus precious Savior. There's no remedy in time setting. There's no remedy in a false prophet. There's no remedy in new light. What we need is to see Jesus dying. When we see him dying, that's the remedy for sin. That's the remedy for sin. Now, I'm done with false prophets. Let's re read Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. Now, I'm not reading the whole of Daniel 12. We're just going to read. Um, let's jump to verse. Six, I'm not reading 12, close of probation, time of trouble, special resurrection. Now, Daniel chapter 12, verse 6. Now, Daniel speaking, yeah? And actually, it's the, um, Gabriel and Jesus. It says, and one, and one said to the man clothed in linen, Gabriel is speaking to Jesus, which is upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now, if someone says, what is they talking about? What, when, how long shall be the end of these wonders? Now, the Hebrew word wonders, I checked it up, is also translated marvels. Marvel. Wonders translated. Is wonder and marvel sound the same thing if I said he, he, he wondered or he marveled at? It's, 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 it's similar. Now, I want you to see what, what marvels is he referring to or wonders is he referring to. Daniel 11, 35. Did I say 35? Sorry, 36. Daniel 11, 36. It says, And the king shall do according to his will. This is the king of the north. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak, there's that word, marvelous things against the God of gods. 
and shall prosper till indignation be accomplished. For that, that is determined shall be done. So when he asks what, when, 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 when Gabriel is speaking to Jesus, says how long shall be these wonders? What is he asking about? How, how long shall be these marvels? How long will the king of the north persecute the people of God? Let's see the answer in verse 7 of Daniel 12. And I heard the man clothed with linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him that liveth forever. Can you see that this is Jesus, similar to Daniel 10? And that it should be for a time, it shall be for a time, times, and a half. How long is time, times, and a half? 1,260. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So question, how long does the persecution of the papacy was it to last in the past? Now, let me tell you what they do now. They say Daniel 7 refers to, and the book of Daniel refers to a persecution of the papacy during the dark ages, the time, times, and off. That's dark ages. But they say, this is what they ask. Revelation 13, is it future, past? That's what they ask. So many people pick up their hand and say it's future. And then they go to Revelation 13 verse 5 and it says that power was given unto him for 42 months. And they say, can you see that the papacy is going to rule for 42 months? In the, for 42 months he's going to persecute God's people. When? In the future. Now my question is this. The 42 months of Revelation, is that past, present, future? When is that? Let's go there. I see people are not, they say, no, yeah, I'm not sure. Let's go and read it. Let's go and read it. Let's read it. So it's speaking about the papacy here. And it says in verse 5, speaking about the papacy. Now, friends, when you read the description of the beast of the papacy of Revelation 13, it's, the, it's, it's linked to Daniel 7 because it talks about the lion, the bear, the leopard. Now, look at verse 5. It says, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. My question to you, because they say, what can we expect in the future? If this, where's this chart? Where's this chart? They say 1,260 years of persecution. 1,260 years, 60 days, I'm sorry, it says days there. They take a literal. So they say in the past it was, it was fulfilled prophetically a day for a year, but in the future we take it literal. In other words, it's a literal 42 months, it's little 1,260. So my question to you is this past, present, or future? It's the past. Now let's don't guess. Look at the prophets here. Let's not guess. I want you to see now, I understand this as the past not as the future. Look at what the prophet says. Great Controversy 266. She says the period here mentioned 40 and two months and 1,260 um, days are the same alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1,260 years of papal supremacy began in 538 and would terminate in 1798. So based on the prophet, how did she understand the 40 and two months? Past, present, or when did she understand it to be fulfilled? She understood it as in the past. Again, there's another quotation I'm not reading, page 54. 54, she says the same thing. If you read the bottom red words, she says that the 1,260 years of papal persecute oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel 7:25 and Revelation 13, verse 5 to 7, she says that that is speaking at the same time. Persecution during the papal, papal supremacy. So friends, we cannot reapply prophecies that were fulfilled in the past, and we're trying to reapply these time prophecies to the future. We cannot do that. We cannot do that. Now listen to what she says. She saw men doing this in Selected Messages, book 2, 111. She says they are persons who are ready to catch up every new idea. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are misinterpreted. It is true that there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled, which is true. But erroneous, but, but very erroneous work 
has been done again and again and will continue to be done by those who seek to find new light in the prophecies, who would begin by turning away from the light God has already given. So she says that men are going to search Daniel Revelation for new light. And what they're going to do, she says, they're going to misinterpret these prophecies. Now, how will they misinterpret red words? But the Lord does not lay upon those who have not had an experience in the work the burden of making new exposition of those prophecies which he has, by his Holy Spirit, moved upon his chosen servants to explain. So question, if the prophet gave us clearly an understanding of the 1,260 and 42 months and Jesus in the past, can we accept that any new interpretation that's going to apply this into the future? We cannot. We cannot. We cannot. She says it very clear. Now let us go to Daniel 12, and we want to conclude. Daniel 12, let's just look at these dates quickly. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. And then we pray. Daniel 12. Let us read verse 11 because of time's sake. Let us just go straight to 11 and 12. So a uh, question. The 1,260 years, is it in the future or has it been fulfilled in the past? Or is it in the past? Let's look at these two dates. Does she say we can reapply these things based on selected messages? Nope. She says we can't do that. Daniel 12 verse 11. And from the time, now this is what I wanted to study with us the daily, but time is gone. But from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, I don't have time to prove it. Now, we'll do it in, a, because I'm looking at time. We'll do it in another study. But I put a chart here. Now, before I show you that chart, let me just say this. From the time that the daily is taken away, we go 2,090, 1,290 years into the future. So let's do this. There's the daily. Let's put your daily. Now, we'll, we'll come back and study this another time. So from the time the daily has taken away. So it began in the year, we'll study what's the daily. The daily, the Hebrew word is tamud. The word daily, yeah? It's just the Hebrew word tamud. You can check it up yourself. Just look at the Greek word tamud and see where it appears in the Bible. You will see that the word tamud has actually translated continual. Do you know what you first see? I'm saying this translation of daily in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 is soaked in sanctuary language. Remember, 2,300 days of sanctuary shall be cleansed. What two animals does Daniel see in Daniel chapter 8? He doesn't see lion, he doesn't see bear, he doesn't see all that. What does he see? He sees a ram and a goat. The ram was in the daily sacrifices and the, the, the goat was the yearly sacrifice. So the old Daniel 8 is soaked in sanctuary language. And that's when it talks about the daily being removed in Daniel 8. Now, what is the daily? I don't know, I've got many texts we could prove and show you. The daily is in connection with the sanctuary, the daily sanctuary service, where it talks about that the daily must be sacrifices. Daily, the table of showbread must be renewed. Daily, the candles must be burning. It's soaked in sanctuary language. So when it talks about daily, what is referring to that Christ is sanctuary um, ministry would be removed by an entity to divert minds from Christ, what he's doing in the holy place, which is the daily, the priest work daily in the holy place, to what man divert their minds from Christ to man who would actually so-called stand in the place of Christ. So the daily has to do with the removal of Christ's sanctuary ministry, which began in the year 508, where Clovis, uh, king of France, gave his power to the papacy and he became the first king to actually start building up the papacy, giving it civil power, so to speak. Then there's other dates as well, 533, ecclesiastical power, 538, the date which we count from, 538 is when the Ostrogoths were uprooted. But if you go from 508, 1290, what, what, what year do you come to? 1798. <coughs> now, question, which nation 
gave him his power, at least started to give power to the papacy to build it up. Which nation started first? What, what nations here? France, Clovis, king of France. Which nation gives it its deadly wound in 1790? France. The very nation that starts this din is the nation that ends the din in 1798. But now, let's look at the next verse. It says in the next verse, blessed, verse 12, blessed is he that waited and come to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. That's the thousand three hundred thirty-five years. Now, from 508, because it's the st same starting point, and you come 1,300, 1,335 years, where do you come to watch here? 1843. The Bible says here, blessed is he that waited and cometh. When did our pioneers first believe Jesus was coming? Huh? Uh-uh. 1843. 1843, the first, the first time they thought, William Miller said 1843, March, April, 1844, uh, March, April. This is when they first thought he was coming. Now, I want to ask you now a question. Have these questions, these dates, prophets, have they been fulfilled? I'm asking, have they been fulfilled? They've been fulfilled. H, H, there's so much to say, I'm not going to say much. I want you to see this. So this is the time prophecy, We're not going there. Listen to what Ellen White says about the 1,300 and... Where's my quote? There's a chair. Please, in the red words, what did Ellen White say? This is Manuscripts, Volume 6, page 251. What does she say about the 1,335? They were ended. What, what was Mr. Br Brother Howard doing? Brother Howard from Dead River was there. He came with a message to the effect that the destruction of the wicked and the sleep of the dead was the abomination within a shut door. I don't know what he was teaching. And that the woman Jezebel, a prophetess, had brought in. And he believed that I was the woman Jezebel. So this is Brother Howard. Brother Howard was reapplying the 1,335 years to the future. And the prophet says, hang on. The 1,335 years were ended. So when people, I don't know how they reset these times when the prophet is so clear that these things were ended. Now friends, do you know how much time is in between these two? Because this year was captivity. This year was captivity for God's people. They were under papacy captivity. Here yeah, was freedom, so to speak. Because they were free from that papal supreme and they were regaining truth. Does anybody know what's between 17 and 19? How many years? Come with me to Joshua 14, 10. How many years are in between there, these two? Quickly, someone, anyone, use your heads quickly. 17, 98, 80. Joshua chapter 14. How many? Yes, 1843, 1843, 45, it should be 45. 45 years. So from captivity to freedom was how many years? For God's people in this chart? 45 years. Or oh, in Joshua 14? I wonder in anciently what was the time from their captivity to their freedom of the promised land. Joshua 14 verse 10. And now... Behold, the Lord had kept me alive as he said. Do you know who's speaking here? Caleb. Caleb speaking. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he had said these 40 and 5 years. Even since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, whilst the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and lo, I am this day four score and five years old. So from the time God spoke the, the, his word to Moses till the time Caleb came into the promised land, how many years? 45. 45. From God's people wandering in the wilderness of captivity to, the, to freedom, how many years? 45. 45. 45. Now, friends, what I am saying is we cannot set time, prophets. No time. We cannot set time but what kind of time, she says, we cannot sit? Definite time. Definite time. 
The longest time prophecy is 2,300 year prophecy. Now I conclude, as much as, we, as much as this is not true, Jesus is coming soon. One sign of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knows the day nor the hour, we are required and expected to know when it is near. We are further taught to disregard, because some people look at this and say, yeah, that's why we don't want present truth. Look at them. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. If you want to sleep, you can keep sleeping, but Jesus is coming. All these prophecies have been fulfilled, past, past, past. We cannot reapply them. We cannot reapply them. Now, if you, someone, sometimes, they, sometimes they don't want to hear Bible and spiritual prophecy. They like sitting in front of the TV and watching, so let's give them a TV man that they like. And let's see what the TV man has to say to them about this world ending. Now, I want you to hear what the, he says. I believe he has some connections as well with the Adventist. And I want you to see why he's saying that the church is, people are not interested in church. He says because there's no power there. He says they are preaching smooth things. Listen to what he has to say. And he says that the, the image of the beast is about to be enforced. He says that the entire world is going to worship. Listen to what he has to say. Oh, that, that's not my one. This one, this is it. So many people are turned off by the church because it's, 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 it's preaching a watered-down uh, Bible, and, it's, it, and it's, it's also just attacking people individually instead of showing them the big picture. The devil's real, God's real, you better pick a side. And so people, right. that's why I'm so much into end times, is it's here, and it's all being fulfilled. And the globalists are fulfilling it and saying, the future's not human, you will merge the machines, you will submit to all our social credit scores, our ESGs, you'll be tracked in live time, uh, the, the, the Bible says everyone worldwide will see the image of the beast talking to them at once. They'll worship it, and that's television, holograms. Right. I mean, it's it's like there's no way John and the Isle of Patmos 2,000 years ago just made this up. No. There's no way Daniel just made it up or Ezekiel, and, and it's just all congruent, proving itself, proving itself, proving itself. And so if someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit of discernment, they read it as much of gibberish. But once right. you actually are, plus we're living in the time. You said something so important. Do you get what he said? We are living in a time of revelation. This, now, now, the man is not, a, is not really a Christian. He's a worldling. But he grew up, he said his grandfather would believe a lot of Bible prophecy and teach. Now, I'm going to conclude. Listen to this. Listen to this. He's going to talk about preparation. Now, this is where I believe he knows something about Adventism. About preparation, food, need to grow, get your, have food, and so forth, and prepare. But listen to what he says is the main preparation. This is more important than guns in your gun cabinet or storable food or water right, is exactly. getting your heart and soul ready because believe me folks without god you, you won't be able to withstand satan this is going to be hardcore no flesh will be spared if god doesn't intervene right he's saying besides your food and your water okay he talks about guns he believes in God, having guns but in his he said about the food and what he says all oh, that's good but he says there's something you need more than that you need the holy spirit inside of you to make it through the crisis Friends, a crisis is truly coming. May God help us to get ready. Error will not settle us in the truth. Error will shake us out of the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let us, let us pray. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for your word, which is truly an anchor amidst the tempests and storms, both of, yeah, this, that this world would bring and also with fanaticism. And Father, we just humbly come before you pleading, yeah, that we would not be surface readers of your word that we will be shaken and tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Please, may we be anchored, and may we sink the shaft deep into your word. For these things are only the pre-test, so to speak. So much winds of doctrine are about to blow. And even though we might profess to know truth on certain of these points, we're going to see very soon that unless we have an experience with Jesus, our knowledge will not save us. Please, Father, I, I humbly plead and ask 
Would you please be with those who are advocating? Yeah, this time we humbly plead that your spirit would convict their hearts before the time comes and pause and much injury is given to the cause. Please, Lord, we, yeah, we just plead on their behalf and please help us, Lord, yeah, to step fast and to get ready for we know that time is almost finished. We love you and we pray these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious in